Let us worship the Lord, and we do so as we sing to his glory and praise in the words of Psalm 24. Psalm 24, we're going to sing from the beginning of the psalm, and we're going to sing down to verse 5, these first five stanzas, Psalm 24, from the beginning of the psalm, down to the verse 5, verses that remind us of the Lord's claim of ownership and propriety and creation upon the earth and all that is there. The earth belongs unto the Lord and all that it contains, the world that is inhabited and all that there remains. For the foundations thereof he on the seas did lay, and he hath it established upon the floods to stay. Who is the man that shall ascend into the hill of God? But who within his holy place shall have a firm abode? Whose hands are clean, whose heart is pure, and unto vanity, who hath not lifted up his soul, nor sworn deceitfully? He from the eternal shall receive the blessing him upon, and righteousness, even from the God of his salvation. Psalm 24, 1 through 5, the earth belongs unto the Lord. The earth belongs unto and all Sing from the God, 
eternal and ever blessed Lord, we draw near in humble gratitude that the way is still open for us and that we have a right of access into the presence of God. Impress upon us, O Lord, that this is a high privilege and a costly one. For this access was procured for us through the death of Christ. For without his atoning work, there is no access. There is no way of coming near. There is indeed no hope for us. But we come today and we give thanks that what was impossible for us has been achieved by the Savior. So that we poor, frail, sinful creatures that we are can come and present our worship. And we discover that it is received and cleansed and accepted in Christ. And we come And we pray that we might know the leading of God's spirit as we come. And that we would know a blessing as we come. That the very psalms we sing would speak to us, resonate in our hearts, speak to our lives and to our souls. And that as this moment, as we come as one in prayer, that we would be given a spirit of prayer and that our thoughts would be led along the right track. The Lord, the Spirit, putting words in our mouth and thoughts in our hearts so that our prayer, our worship, our all, our offering today may be acceptable in the sight of God. And that we may hear the encouragement of God's word for our petitions. And that we will pray in faith, trusting the Lord's power, his grace, his timing, his goodness, his justice, his love, that we will come with hearts filled with faith, not wavering. For those who come wavering are like the, the, the waves of the sea tossed one way and another. But he that cometh unto God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Make us diligent seekers today. Stir us up from our coldness, our half-heartedness, our lethargy. O oh, thou, my soul, bless God the Lord, and all that in me is be stirred up, his holy name, to magnify and bless. Bless, O oh, my soul, the Lord thy God, and not forgetful be we confess how often we are forgetful. Not forgetful be of all his gracious benefits he hath bestowed on thee. How good the Lord is to us, even in spirit and in physical, temporal, outward things. What blessings we have that are denied to many others. What troubles we are spared that are in the cup of other people. What blessing if we have heard of Christ. What blessing if we have received him, turned to him, trusted in him, resting in him. 
What blessing if we can say that he is ours and that we are his and that we are caught up in that bundle of life, that he is the shepherd of our souls, that he is the king of our lives, our great high priest, our prophet, our leader, who will bring us at last to himself. So that when our dust lies in the, in the, in the, in the ground and when we lie in the cemetery on the hill, our spirits will be with Christ, which is far better. We pray thy blessing, Lord, upon each one of us as we come. Each soul. We pray for thy people, Lord, that they might know today feeding in their hearts, that they might know a drawing near in the Lord, a true confession of sin, true repentance, that they would grow today in understanding, grow in faith, grow in hope, grow in love, that the fruits of the Spirit would be multiplying in their soul today, that they would be refreshed of heart, that they would be given strength to face duties and responsibilities and wisdom to meet the burdens and the cares of life. That any who are searching would be found, would be seekers, that they would come across the pearl of great price today and be ready to sell all that they have if they could but have it, that those who are lethargic and cold and half-hearted would be wakened up, that those who have prejudices of mind against the gospel would find them melted away, that those who do not have the fear of God would be given a measure of it. And we all need that, for we fear man and we fear those around us and we, we fear many things, but how little we fear God. O oh Lord, give us that holy fear. Give us that holy sensitivity to the majesty and the highness, the sheer highness of God. It will touch us in a very powerful way. We pray blessing, Lord, upon the congregation and its life and work and the denomination. We think of our uh, congregation scattered across uh, Scotland, across the United Kingdom indeed, and in France and Spain, we pray for the work in Sri Lanka again, giving thanks for it and for its vibrancy, giving thanks for those who have professed faith there in recent weeks, those who have been baptized there in recent weeks, those who have found a spiritual home there in recent months. And we pray that the unrest and the continuing difficulties that afflict that island would a, a not a affect the work of the gospel. We, we are thankful that thus far they have been spared in great measure uh, some of these difficulties. And yet we know that they do have difficulties every day, undertake for them in that gracious, wonderful way. We pray for the work of the gospel beyond our borders. We pray for all who preach Christ and him crucified. Our desire is that they would prosper even as we would prosper. And we are thankful, Lord, for the breadth of Christ's church. For those with whom we share the, the most important things. There is a oneness among the people of God that transcends language and culture and race and color, that transcends the denominational boundaries of this world. And they are a grief to our heart, but they are there and we are where we are. But we are thankful, Lord, that there is a a fellowship in Jesus uh, that we discover with those who have come to know him and to love him. We pray, Lord, for blessing then upon the work of the gospel up and down our land and indeed the, the work of the nation itself. We pray, Lord, for blessing. We, we remember our nation in this remarkable week when Platinum Jubilee has been recognized and celebrated. We are thankful, Lord, for the stability of these 70 years when many nations in the world have known chronic instability and civil war and unrest and all manner of turbulence, we have been spared many of these things. We do remember today in a particular way the Queen, we know that she is knowing her age and her frailty. It's, none of us are spared that. 
And we know that at the end of the day, we will all lie in the same small portion of crust. Whatever titles we have in this world, they are for this world. They're for a few years here. But blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. For they will have a title that they will never lose. And a crown of glory that they will never give up. We pray, Lord, that she would have that in her own experience. She is the daughter of a king. We do pray that she would know what it is to be the king's daughter. Behold, the daughter of the king, all glorious is within. That she would be the daughter of a heavenly king. And that we would all be that, exalted to spiritual royalty. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Remember all who are unwell. We pray for them and progress and healing according to the Lord's will and time. We pray for those who mourn. We pray for those whose lives are filled with joy and gladness. Even uh, those that we united in marriage this very week itself. We do remember that young couple. And we pray for them at the beginning of their married lives and to say look ahead. To serve the Lord in this world. That their marriage would be used to strengthen the kingdom of Christ. And that together they would be shaped and fashioned in these years of study and preparation. To be those who will be useful in the ministry of the gospel. There is no nobler calling in this world. And to direct men and women to heaven. Callings of this world are good and legitimate. And we take nothing from them. But they are of this world. And we will not take an inch of it with us. Go before us now. Cleanse us from sin. Lead us as we study the word. Lead us so that we will find it. Echoing in our own heart's experience. Help us to understand it. To focus well. To listen. Keep the enemy at bay, he would love to disrupt. He, he circles these gatherings and he, he moves from pew to pew with his whispers and his distractions. Our oh Lord, we pray that he would be muzzled and silenced and forced back today. We think of those who return from the work of the Lord to be told that Jesus himself had seen Satan. Fall as lightning from heaven. And he is still falling. We are thankful that he is still falling. He's always going to be falling. For he is defeated. The seed of the woman has crushed the head. And the serpent. Is but in its death throes. The fiend. Is defeated. And it is but a matter of time. Till he is cast into the bottomless pit. Spare us from following him. Deliver us from it. Finding our answer. For Jesus' sake. Amen. <clears throat> Can we. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can we read together now in God's word in the book of Leviticus? Book of Leviticus in chapter 25. Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus is the third in these successive books of Moses. We have Genesis and Exodus. And then we have Leviticus chapter 25. And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, 
Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the Lord, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest, thou shalt not reap. Neither gather the grapes of thy vine and rest, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee, for thy servant, for thy maid, for thy hired servant, for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee, and for thy cattle, and for the beasts that are in thy land shall all the increase thereof be meat. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years to thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to thee forty-nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And you shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the lands to all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee to you. And you shall return every man to his possession. And you shall return every man to his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. You shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine and rest. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. You shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, you shall return every man to his possession. And if thou sell aught to thy neighbor or buy aught of thy neighbor's hand, you shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the jubilee, thou shalt buy of thy neighbor and According to the number of years of the fruits, he shall sell to thee. According to the multitude of years, thou shalt increase the price thereof. And according to the fewness of years, thou shalt diminish the price of it. But according to the number of the years of the fruits that he sell unto thee, you shall not therefore oppress one another. Thou shalt fear the, thy God, for I am the Lord your God. Wherefore you shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land in safety. And the land shall yield her fruit. And you shall eat your fill and dwell therein in safety. And if you shall say, what shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow nor gather in our increase. Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years, and you shall sow the eighth year, and eat yet of all fruits till the ninth year, until our fruits come in, you shall eat of the old store. And thus far we read, may the Lord follow with his own blessing that reading of his holy word gives particular promises in connection with the reading of his word. It's compared to the rain that comes down and refreshes the soil. Pray that it would refresh the soil of our hearts today and that God's name would be glorified as we come in worship and read of it publicly. We turn to Psalm 145. We're going to sing the first version, Psalm 145, the first version of the psalm, and we are going to sing there from verse uh, 9. Alistair Patterson, thank you. Good to sing to you. Psalm 145 and at verse 9. The Lord Jehovah unto all his goodness doth declare, and over all his other works his tender mercies are. 
Thee all thy works shall praise, O Lord, and thee thy saints shall bless. He shall thy kingdom's glory show, thy power by speech express. To make the sons of men to know his acts done mightily, and of his kingdom the excellent and glorious majesty. Thy kingdom shall forever stand, thy reign through ages all. God raiseth all that are bowed down, upholdeth all that fall. The eyes of all things wait on thee. Now, we saw reference to this in, in our reading there in, um, in Leviticus. God, God providing, and I'll return to that in a moment. The eyes of all things wait on thee, the giver of all good. Thou in time convenient bestowest on them their food. Thy hand thou openst liberally, and of thy bounty gives enough to satisfy the need of everything that lives. The Lord is just in all his ways, holy in his works all. God's near to all that call on him, in truth that on him call. From 9 through 18, seven stanzas, the Lord Jehovah unto all. <clears throat> The Lord
Friends, it's my intention today to put to one side our studies in the gospel according to Mark, to turn again to that passage which we read together in the Old Testament scriptures and in the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus and chapter 25. And I'm intending to look at the fairly extensive section of the passage, but we'll Take verse 10 as our connecting link. Leviticus 25 and at verse 10. And you shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. It shall be a jubilee unto you. Now, I'm sure that all of us, even those who are younger, will know that this has been a special week in the history of our nation. This week has been the Platinum Jubilee of Her Majesty the Queen. Now, a Jubilee, as we're told here in the chapter, is a period of 50 years. And 10 years ago, we had the Diamond Jubilee, which is 60 years. And this year, uh, it is a Platinum Jubilee, which is very, very unusual. Because now 70 years have passed since her reign began. Now, many people would be very surprised, I suspect, if they were to discover that Jubilee, like so many other things, finds its origins in the Word of God. And it finds its beginnings in a practice which the Lord himself introduced in Israel. Indeed, the word Jubilee comes from a Hebrew root. It probably took its name from the horns, which we're told in verse 9, were blown like trumpets to tell Israel that the 50th year, the year of Yobal, the year of Jubilee, had finally arrived. Now, there are two things I want to focus on today as we come to this passage. Two purposes that Jubilee served, or to put it maybe a slightly easier way, two things that the year of Jubilee did. First of all, Jubilee reminded them of certain things. It reminded them of certain things, and I'm going to focus on just two of these certain things. First of all, it reminded them in a very practical way that the earth was the Lord's. The earth was the Lord's. By this law of Jubilee, the Lord was asserting his sovereign right as creator 
to the earth. He was reminding them and us through them that the earth is the Lord's. That we are here, Adam was appointed to care for the earth and to look after it. No, of course, Adam falls into sin and chaos descends. But that didn't change the fact that the earth was the Lord's and that Adam and his descendants were tenants responsible for their care of what was left in their charge. But that's all we are. It is not ours in that highest sense. Every inch of it, every particle in it, in us, belongs to him. And he was reminding Israel of that because they were prone to forget it as we are prone to forget it. My life is mine and it's my own. Well, ultimately it's not. Not one square inch of it. It belongs to the one who gave it. And at the last, the spirit will return to God who gave it. It is his. And it's good to be reminded of that. And in Israel, on this 50th year, no fields were to be tilled. No fields were to be used because he said so. Now, there were good practical reasons for this, which I'll touch on in a moment, perhaps. But the ultimate reason wasn't that it was good for the ground to give it rest. It was. But the primary reason was that the Lord said so. The earth is the Lord's. Now, as I've been suggesting for the last two or three minutes, we have largely forgotten this and in fact, gone out of our way to, to reject this. But whether we reject it or not, ultimately it's neither here nor there. It is still as true today as it was then, we began our service today with these words in Psalm 24, the earth belongs unto the Lord and all that it contains. I'm not going to labor that point anymore, but it reminded them that the earth was the Lord's and everything in it and everyone on it. And incidentally, that means that the future survival of the earth is not ultimately down to us. We don't believe it'll end a second before it's time. Yes, we are to use earth's resources wisely. Of course we are. But we do not panic about it. There's a great panic abroad. But God's word assures us, even that passage after the flood, that while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and day and night, and summer and winter, it will not cease. It will vary, perhaps, and no doubt it does, from place to place and from century to century. The earth is the Lord's. He is well able to sustain what he has made. And the closer we follow his instructions, the better it will be for us. In our own lives and in society out there. However, I am wondering on my part. The Jubilee reminded them of certain things. It reminded them 
that the earth was the Lord's, and it reminded them, secondly, that the Lord could provide for every need they had. Now look at verse six, verses three and four. Six years thou shalt labor thy field, sow thy field. Six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, gather in the fruit thereof. Well, that's just the ordinary agricultural cycle. Year in, year out, you plant, you plant, you, you reap, you plant, you reap, you plant, you reap. Verse four, but in the seventh year, shall be a Sabbath of rest to the land. A Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. In other words, every seven years, the land, the ground, was given a rest. There was no planting. And in that seventh year, when there was no planting, the Lord provided. There's a question asked. I can't find the verse just now. Um, yes, there it is, verse 20. You shall say, what shall we eat the seventh year? Verse 21, I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year. In other words, the Lord provided a good enough harvest in year six to see them through year six and through year seven until the point when the whole cycle would begin again. This principle of seven, seven is one of the important numbers in the Bible. It's, it's an important principle. It's right there in creation. The seventh day is a day of rest. And the seventh year in Israel was to be a year of rest. And on the seventh day and on the seventh year, the Lord provided. You remember the rules about gathering the manna eh, when they were in the wilderness. The Lord sent manna. Day one, day two, day three. The Lord told them, we'll not be there in one out of seven. The rules for that day were different. No planting, no sowing in the seventh year. So that's the seventh year. That happened again in the 14th year, in the 21st year, in the 28th year, in the 35th year. Just work your way through the seven times table. In the 42nd year, in the 49th year. Hold on a minute. There's something happening in 49th year because there was also no sowing on the 50th year because it was Jubilee. So at the time of Jubilee, there was not just one year with no sowing and planting, there were two years without sowing or planting. Would they starve in the second year? Not at all. Because the Lord provided enough in year 48 to cover year 49 and year 50. And then you're back to the beginning and the whole cycle began all over again. Verse 20 and 21 again. I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. Year 48, in other words, was a bumper, bumper harvest. Now, these rules of agriculture and ground, of course, belonged to Israel in their nationhood and to the Old Testament period. And we are not bound by these uh, rules of civil society in Israel. Again, that's something that people get all confused about. They don't, they forget that there's a threefold distinction in the law in the Old Testament. If you don't understand that, you, you'll, you'll get confused. On there's the ceremonial law, which uh, applied to the worship of Israel in the Old Testament, that's fulfilled in Christ. There's the moral law, summarized in the Ten Commandments, which abides forever. And there was the civil law, which uh, was the rules that ran Jewish Old Testament society. Now that has passed because Jewish Old Testament society has passed. But the general principles contained in it carry on into the New Testament church. 
But in our day, if anybody was to suggest a year with no plastic, society would throw up its hands in horror and say, well, we're all going to starve. It seems that one rest day in seven is too much to ask, let alone a whole year. But the soil benefited from rest. Those of you who, who, who plant, you know that. You keep going in the same patch of ground, the same things, the ground becomes weird. The soil benefited from rest and they lacked nothing because the Lord provided. So Jubilee reminded them of certain things. It reminded them the earth was the Lord's and it reminded them that he could provide for every need two sound principles. But more importantly, not only did the Jubilee remind them of certain things, but the Jubilee directed them to a certain person. And that's more important. Like all the feasts, like all the customs of Israel in the Old Testament, like every page, in fact, of the Old Testament, Jubilee was pointing forward to the one who was to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does Jubilee say about Jesus? Well, I'm going to mention two things. First of all, it tells us that he brings redemption. Maybe you're struggling, the younger ones, with that word redemption. To redeem is to buy back. You could maybe think of it as deliverance or, well, I'll, I'll illustrate it in a moment. Maybe that's the best way to do it. He brings redemption and he does this in three ways. Now, if you look at the passage again, you'll see that in the year of Jubilee, not only was the land given rest, but certain other things happened. First of all, they gave liberty to any slaves that might be enslaved. Now, there were uh, reasons for that in Israel. I'm not going to go into it just now. Some people could put them into, themselves into slavery in order to, to pay debt and so on. We'll leave that to one side just now. We accept it as a simple fact that it existed to an extent. Sadly, of course, it still does. But in Israel, as soon as the Jubilee arrived, anybody in that condition was set free. That was it. However long you had been in that condition, you were free. You can imagine the joy of anybody enslaved for whatever reason when they heard the trumpet of jubilee sound that's it my chains are gone i'm free all the way through the bible jesus is painted for us as the one who sets his people free the bible shows us that we are slaves slaves of sin and satan slaves of our own corruption that's why we return to the same sins again and again. Maybe you've discovered this. Maybe you've discovered you can't break the chain, can't break the habit. Well, there is one who sets free. That's what he does for his people. That's what he does for men and women when they come to him. He sets them free from Satan's clutches. He sets them free from the, the power of sin. And you better believe sin is powerful. We think sometimes, don't we, we can control sin. And we can manipulate sin. Friend, it manipulates us. It's like trying to control a tiger. Trying to keep a tiger in your front room. A tiger in the front room, it's the boss. You're not the boss. Same with sin and Satan. But he sets his people free. He breaks the chains and he sets them free. Free to do what? Free to do whatever they like? Oh, no. but free to follow him. Free to serve him. Free to love him. You imagine then that slave in Israel. There's the trumpet of jubilee sounding all the joy of that person's heart. I'm free. 
That's what the Christian says. I'm free. I was once enslaved the power and grip of power greater than my own. That power was driving me the wrong direction, further and further and further in the wrong direction. And occasionally, half-heartedly, I might try to get out of it, but that past, his grip is too strong. As Luther said to his young friend, old Adam is too strong for young Melanchthon. And so it is. But if the Son will make you free, Jesus himself says, then are you free indeed. So he gives freedom from slavery. But then the other thing that happened in the year of Jubilee was that they were given freedom from debt. In Jewish society, just like our own, people used to get into debt. And that debt would obviously have to be repaid. In the year of Jubilee, all debts were cancelled. It was an astonishing society, Old Testament Israel. It stood like a light. They were surrounded by pagan nations that were brutal in the extreme. In the extreme. And their lives were governed by rules of remarkable fairness and graciousness and mercy. There was nothing like it in its day and time, not remotely. The rights of property and life were guarded. Women and children were guarded in a way that no other society around them knew, not remotely. There was the deliverance then from debt. But what a blessing that was. For the Bible tells us that we are all in debt, in debt to God and in debt to his law. And of course, we are not law keepers, but law breakers. We've broken the law and we have no means of payment. You park your car in the wrong place for a tree, you come back to the car and there'll be a sticker on it. There'll be a fine. She'll have to pay. If you don't pay it in a certain time, it'll become bigger. If you don't pay it then, well, other things will happen and who knows where it'll all end. You've broken the law. Now, you may say, I don't agree with that law. I don't think that law should exist. The law doesn't care whether you agree with it or not. Your feelings on the matter are utterly irrelevant. The law is the law. You break it, you pay the penalty. It's very simple. And it's ultimately the same. You break God's law. There is a penalty. And it must be paid. You may say, well, I disagree with this law. Well, again, it's neither here nor there. We have no means of payment. How are we going to cancel our debt? How are we going to pay our way out of this? It's impossible. Let's think about what, what the price of one sin is. What does every sin deserve? God's wrath and curse, both in this life and in that which is to come. You multiply that by two, you've got double. You multiply it by 10, you've got tenfold, which is unimaginable. You multiply it by a million, you've got a million fold. You multiply it by a billion, you've got a billion fold. So you've got a billion fold debt. What does Jesus do for his people? He pays their debt. He meets divine justice and he asks what it demands. And he pays the debt. That's what the cross is all about. It's a cancelling of debt. It's a paying of price. It's a taking of the penalty. It's a taking of the curse and the condemnation of the broken law. 
There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin, says the poet. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. And justice is satisfied with what he brings, what he offers, what he pays. He pays with his life. He takes the damnation of his people and it becomes his. Nobody else could carry that. Only he could carry it. He must be God and man. The scales are heavily against us, but he pays in his reconciling death. His blood obliterates every charge. No death remains, Christian. Maybe Satan's troubling you about the sins of the past. Ah, you remind him their pain. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son. What does it do? It blots out the sin of those who trust him. Romans 8.1 There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Oh, friend, you have a jubilee to be glad of. But he did a third thing, and I must tell you. It's freedom for any enslaved. Deliverance from debt. The third thing that happened in Israel in the year of jubilee was that anybody who had been dispossessed of their inheritance got it back. Now, again, we don't need to go into the reasons why they might be dispossessed. But you'd lost your inheritance. Very sad. The trumpet sounds for jubilee. What I lost, I get back again. When Adam fell, we lost everything. We were utterly dispossessed. We lost our holiness. We lost our peace. We lost our inheritance of heaven. We lost our communion with God. All gone. I, uh, I often think of, of Adam and Eve in that first moment of realization. In that first meeting with God, the utter devastation. It, you can't even imagine it. The utter devastation as they realize that they brought the whole thing down about themselves. It must have been absolutely awful. But there in the wreckage of humanity, God gives a promise about the seed of the woman who will bruise the head of the serpent. What does Jesus do? He restores to his people what they lost. He restores holiness and righteousness and peace and peace with God and heaven itself. He gives back what we lost. In fact, he gives back far more than we lost. What you have as a Christian is far more than Adam had. You have more than he had. Here in Leviticus 25, God acts to redeem. He takes the initiative. He says it's time to give back. It's time to set free. It's time to cancel death. It wasn't Moses that came up with this. It's God because he is the great supreme redeemer. He takes the initiative. Oh, yes, indeed. He brings redemption. That's what it tells us about Jesus. And he brings rest. He gives a jubilee to the soul. There you were, Christian, once trying to earn God's favor, toiling away till you came to understand that though you lived as long as Methuselah, you'd never manage. 
Now you've come to trust in Christ alone. You've heard the trumpet of the gospel, the trumpet of jubilee. Perhaps you're here and you're still trying to earn God's favor. Friend, he brings redemption. He brings jubilee, not you. It pointed them to a certain person. It pointed them to Jesus. He brings redemption. He brings rest. He still does. I must try to tie this up. He gives jubilee to the soul. They blew the horn to tell the people that the year of jubilee had come. What do we do? We blow the gospel trumpet, if you like. We speak of Jesus as the Redeemer, who sets free the captives, who cancels the dead, who gives back to the dispossessed, who gives rest. Rest and redemption. But there's one more thing that I must say before I finish. When exactly did Jubilee begin? If you were to look at an Old Testament calendar, you were to flip through it and see, now when is Jubilee? What date? Did you notice? Verse 9, you shall cause the trumpet of jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement. Ah, isn't that interesting? It began on the day of atonement. That great special day held once a year, a day perhaps more than any other in Israel that pointed forward to Christ and the cross, a day in which the high priest did certain special things that found their fulfillment in Jesus. The day of atonement. What's atonement? Well, you break the word down a bit and help you. At one minute. At one. You know your garlic, you'll know that it's red if it's used there. If you break that word down a little, it gives you the word rare. And if you're rare with somebody, you're at one with them. You're at peace with them. All is well. If you're not rare with somebody, then all is not well. But rare it's where two are brought together who are not at peace and made peace. He is our peace. Well, that's what atonement is. Jubilee, you see, was closely identified with the day of atonement. Why? Because they had to understand that without atonement, there could be no jubilee. Two things are bound together, and they still are. Without Jesus' atonement, there's no spiritual jubilee. There's no rest. There's no redemption without atonement because we are reconciled to God by the death of his son. Rest and redemption. It is the year of Jubilee. May God bless his word. Let us pray. Bless thy word, O Lord, we pray. Grant that we may find for ourselves and in our own hearts something of a spiritual Jubilee. That we will know what it is to have rest and redemption. Because the day of atonement has come. Our great high priest has offered himself. And the way to the holy of holies is open. Help us to blow the trumpet of jubilee. And help us to hear it. And to understand it. For Jesus' sake. 
Amen. We're going to sing in Psalm 146 verses that speak of the Lord setting free and helping and delivering. We're going to sing from verse 7. Alistair McLeod, would you lead us? Psalm 146 and at verse 7. 146 and at 7. Who righteous judgment executes for those oppressed that be, who to the hungry giveth food, God sets the prisoners free. The Lord doth give the blind their sight, the bowed down doth raise. The Lord doth dearly love all those that walk in upright ways. The stranger's shield, the widow's stay, the orphan's help is he. Yet by him the wicked's way turn upside down, shall be down to verse seven, eight, ten rather. Righteous judgment executes. <clears throat> of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion and fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit, rest on and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen.